From the Radio Cafe and the Kivira Coalition, you're listening to Down to Earth, the Planet to Plate podcast. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domandi. So today's program is a little different. I'd like to introduce Annika Wong. She is Kivira Coalition's new communications director, and we're going to have a conversation about, well, all kinds of things, including what she does. Welcome, Annika. Thank you so much for having me, Mary Charlotte. So you have fairly recently come to the Kivira Coalition. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, you are, as well as a communications and media person, you are also doing urban farming. Yeah, so I started at Kivira in May and was really excited to be able to step into this brand new communications director role. Uh, I think that speaks to the growth of the organization, that they were needing somebody with really specific communications experience and background to step in to just help with strategy about talking about the work that we're doing, getting the work out to the community, and really just telling the story of the amazing people that we work with and the amazing tasks and roles and engagement that we do within the community. So that was really exciting. Um, As you mentioned, my partner and I do own an urban farm in Denver. We have been farming here in the city for four years. So we just wrapped up our fourth season. We are situated on an acre and a half of land. Currently, we grow on about half an acre. So it's a really cool thing to be able to kind of marry my personal life uh, excitement and interests with my work excitement and interests. I've been able to meet so many great people within the Kavira sphere that have also really inspired me within the work that we're doing here on the farm and vice versa, right? Like I've learned a lot in the field that I can kind of bring now to not only the communications and how we speak to farmers and ranchers, but also just like what it takes to kind of put in the work that we are asking maybe our soil health partners to do. That is a lot of work and I get that and and just being really cognizant of what our expectations are and how we can really provide the best support to our partners as we work with them in whatever way that may be. What are you actually growing on your farm? Well, right now, uh, nothing because it's uh, the middle of December, even though it was about 60 degrees last week here in Denver. Um, But we grow all of our normal market veggies, right? Everything from tomatoes to cucumbers to radishes, lots of greens, um, carrots, pretty much everything that you might buy at the grocery store, uh, we probably grow. We have dabbled in growing flowers. Um, I'm not very good at it, so it's definitely a learning curve. But really, we are just excited to be able to offer fresh, really nutritious food to our community um, and to bring them in to help them understand why local produce that is accessible is really important, not only to us as people, right? We need to eat food. If we are going to do that, we might as well eat really good food, Um, but also to the soil health and the health of our community in general. I have to ask you, how much of your own food that you eat is the food that you're actually growing on your farm? That's a great question. I was thinking about that the other day as I went to the grocery store, um, especially in the height of the season. I really only go to the grocery store for milk and cottage cheese and lemons. Um, Is that right? Yeah. And everything else we are pretty much, uh, we're growing or we we buy big cuts of meat, and so we have a lot of meat, uh, a lot of grass-fed beef in our in our freezer, and so it just is kind of getting into that concept of seasonal eating, and in the middle of the summer, it's really cool to not have to go to the store to buy a bunch of stuff. Obviously, during the during the winter, that that changes. We still try to buy as locally as possible. There are still some producers who grow throughout the winter, and so we try to source as much as we can from them, but it definitely is harder, especially here in Denver. Yeah, yeah. I mean, winter greens are something that I've started trying to do. It's it's tricky just depending on how, how cold it gets. 
Totally. And and what your setup is, you know, do you have a, a good greenhouse or a good really kind of like warm area that those plants can survive in? It's definitely something that we are looking forward to trying. It's not going to be this season, uh, maybe not next season, but uh, if we can extend that season, even just for us, right? Like maybe we're not selling throughout the whole year, but if I can go out and pick lettuce in the deep of January. That's pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about why don't you tell our listeners what we're doing on the show today? Sure. Yeah. So we wanted to do kind of an ask me anything type podcast to offer an opportunity for listeners to send in their questions to get a chance to hear from you about yourself and about the podcast instead of you being on the on the question side. So just trying to trying to bring in the listeners as much as we can into this episode. I love to start out and ask you to kind of reflect on 2023. What Did you learn? Who did you really enjoy chatting with? What was a really cool aspect of this year as you reflect back on the people that you interviewed? I mean, I don't really like to pick favorites because every single interview that I do, I just end up being very excited about the about the people and I always end up learning something. And if you ask me at any given moment, it tends to be like the most recent person or, or people that I did, but like one of them that I thought was really exciting. And part of it was that he was here in Santa Fe. Um, Eric Olson wrote a book called The Regenerative Landscaper. And because you and I are, I mean, you know, Kivira and we here on Down to Earth are doing regenerative agriculture, regenerative landscaping was a slightly different take that we hadn't done before. And, you know, learning that the pesticide and herbicide use on lawns exceeds the use of those chemicals on all of freaking agriculture in the United States. I mean, that's just mind blowing. And there's so much of a kind of shift of mind and way of seeing that I feel like so many people need to do who think who who look at this perfectly manicured monoculture, you know, Kentucky bluegrass lawn and think that's beautiful. And then a shift to seeing a more sort of biodiverse lawn or yard or garden or whatever you want to call it as as being even more beautiful. And that's something. So I got really excited about that. I totally agree. And I think that that is something that we talk about here at the farm a lot is that if you consider all of the lawns in the United States, if we planted food in even a small fraction of them, right, how much food could we actually produced? How many people could we actually feed? If I know how much I can grow on half an acre, right? I feed a lot of families throughout the season. Think if you just, if you were just feeding yourself, right? If you went out in the middle of the summer and cut a head of lettuce for yourself, that's one less head of lettuce that is being shipped from California all the way to wherever you are. Uh, that that makes a difference. And, and that was Definitely one of the the takeaways that I had from that episode as well of just like we don't conceptualize lawns on this like really large scale. We think of them as like I have a lawn and that's it, right? It's not like, oh, there are so many millions of acres of lawns and what does that mean? How can we change that? Yeah. And so many of those lawns are built on the most sort of fertile, arable, former farmland that they're just ready to be cultivated. And even if you're not growing food, and of course we favor growing food, but even if you're not doing that, growing biodiverse landscapes that are like pollinator habitat and bird habitat and things like that also make a really big difference. Most definitely. Yep. Yeah. Any Anything but lawn, right? And that's me personally saying that, but with a history of, hey, we, we want to we wanna continue to help our earth survive and thrive. And that could be one way that we all get involved. So let's go to some uh, listener questions here. First one up is, what have you learned from your interviews that gives you a hope for a more resilient future? And by the way, I 
I just want to thank all the people who wrote in. They wrote amazing questions. And I really, I had to, like, I spent all day yesterday trying to, or just really thinking about them and making some notes. But this, of course, is a, a great question. And I mean, I have a bunch of different answers to that. I mean, one is the fact that there are just so many people working on resilience at every level. The way I got into this whole topic of regenerative agriculture was when I was doing a daily radio show on public radio in 20, I think it was 2014, I interviewed, I did two interviews during the Kivira Coalition conference. I went down to Albuquerque and I interviewed Gabe and Paul Brown and Paul and Elizabeth Kaiser. Gabe and Paul Brown are in um, North Dakota and Paul and Elizabeth Kaiser are in California. And they were the first ones from whom I really learned that you could be resilient and you could make money, actually more money, farming and ranching, doing regenerative ag than doing the conventional. Gabe was doing conventional, and he almost went bankrupt, and then he started doing regenerative, and he's been flourishing ever since. And, I mean, another thing that gives me hope is that there are so many young people who want to go into agriculture now, even though it's not easy. I mean, when I was graduating from college, I feel like about half of my graduating class went to or more went to Wall Street, law school, or medical school. I mean, the the very idea of sustainability wasn't even a thing. So that gives me a lot of hope. And then, like, the move toward small and medium-sized businesses on a local and regional scale, even though monopoly capitalism, you know, shareholder, publicly traded food companies, and and also private equity, which is a very insidious problem, I think, in agriculture. Those are still big impediments. But, you know, the history of agriculture is small and medium-sized local and regional businesses. And since, you know, monopoly capitalism is fundamentally unsustainable, I just feel like that movement that Kivira and other organizations are promoting is really a hopeful movement. And another thing that gives me hope is the fact that when I started doing all this in 2014, nobody that I knew had heard of regenerative agriculture. Now, everybody's heard of it. Everybody's re- excited about it. The downside of that is like co-optation and greenwashing. But, you know, that's, a, that's another conversation that I hope we'll have. And the other thing that I wanted to say that I've learned from doing these interviews is that regenerative agriculture is really compatible with religious faith and at the same time with science. And there's this whole thing of like faith versus reason, which I think is a false dichotomy. I mean, scientific reason is great and real and incredibly useful. Religious experience is also real to so many people. And in both perspectives, we have this like complex web of life. And whether it's the love of God, the love of life, the love of land, the love of creation. We don't have to argue about those things. Whatever place you're coming from, that love of regeneration is real. And I've interviewed and met people whose religious faith is so strong and so much a part of their work in agriculture. And I just feel like that's a a really interesting and exciting thing. Yeah, that's such an interesting take. I would love to potentially like hear more about that in 2024, right? Like how do we, who do we talk to? How do we bring that, that thought into the mix and really offer it out to the community and see how do we feel? What does this feel like and look like in, you know, in your own space, in your land, in in your work? I think that would be really interesting. Well, one of the conference speakers was the veterinarian and farmer Hubert Karaman. And he really, he talked about that. We talked about that a little bit on the show, but he's coming from a very deeply spiritual place. And he's a scientist. He's a veterinarian. So it's, I just think that's, I don't know. I just love that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's those, like you're saying, those dichotomies that maybe aren't really dichotomies deserve some introspection and and exploration. Definitely. Let's see. Next question. What have been the most cutting edge innovative projects or operations you've learned about through your work? So again, I have a number of different answers to that. One of them 
is the work that Dorn Cox is doing. We interviewed him this year on the book that he co-wrote with Courtney White, who's one of the founders of the Kivira Coalition. The book is called The Great Regeneration, and they're combining regenerative agriculture with all kinds of technology that helps people to develop markets and share information and share data and be in community with each other over huge geographical and really international scales. And it's like, it's kind of mind boggling. Like I don't fully (laughs) even comprehend what they're doing, but I think it's a, a definitely cutting edge and innovative project. At the same time, equally cutting edge and innovative in our world are things like goatscaping and sheepscaping and all the all the ways to do land management without big fossil fuel based machines and like the work that Bill Zedike has been doing with one rock dams and different kinds of you know using very low tech techniques to alter the landscape to make it more resilient and retain water better and so on and like Zach Weiss's work with building these water structures that hold and infiltrate water that people can really do on a farm and ranch scale. I mean, I think those are cutting edge technologies too. And we don't need Silicon Valley for that. We don't need venture capital. We don't need to expend energy except for like muscle energy or small scale earth mover kind of energy. Another one that I still am excited about is Reginaldo Haslet Marroquin, who's doing, I think still doing, this super innovative poultry farming in which they're raising chickens, which I didn't know this. I mean, chickens are jungle fowl. They're jungle animals, and they need canopy. They're not suited to being out in the sun. So so he's like, okay, how do you adapt chicken farming to your local region? Well, if you're in a corn area, their canopy is corn, and they can also eat it. Or if you're in a tree area you can grow nut trees and they can eat you know this it's like it's super ecosystem based but it's also very much about doing this kind of chicken farming to scale that is successful in your local market so i think that's really interesting i I think ag ag is such a great place where you can be as high tech as you want, or you can be as low tech as you want. And all of it kind of is working hopefully toward the better good, right? Hopefully all of these things are helping you be more efficient and helping you grow what you want to grow and helping you to understand what is happening in your soil. And I think, again, that dichotomy of low tech and high tech potentially being as good as each other is a dichotomy that may only exist in ag where you can really like you get to choose which way you want to go and for your place and what works best for your people and your land Uh, and that's that's a really cool opportunity for you as a land steward to make the choice of which way you go and what you implement and and hopefully hear some cool ideas and again try them on your spot and if they work awesome if they don't now you know and you move on to something else and I think that what you're saying feeds really into that whole appropriate technology movement and the idea that it's not about the latest coolest gadget, which is really based in somebody wanting to make money, but in what's appropriate for the space in which you're working. Totally. And I think, you know, we've seen that with indigenous knowledge of they were using what they knew on the land that they knew. And maybe we need to go back to some of those things, um, some of those tools in kind of an appropriate way that makes sense for the times and and for the land um, and the people that are there. So I, yeah, I I really like, again, that dichotomy of you get, you almost get to choose your own adventure here. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's a couple of others that I, that I made a note of. And one is the restoration of the Lus Plateau in China, which filmmaker John Liu documented over the course of 25 years. And that was 4 million acres in China of this overgrazed, overharvested land. And China as a nation, you know, it was a government initiative to restore it. And they did. And one of the things that they did, I mean, they took this barren, 
dry, totally screwed up land. And now it's like green and thriving. And part of it was the theory of not using every inch, you know, leaving some of it to nature. And when you leave it to nature, the parts that you're growing food on are actually more productive than when you try to maximize and optimize and all those things that just don't really work. It's a, a great, great idea and, and great concept in general, not only for ag, but kind of for your life, right? Like what are the things that you can maybe set down and like let exist in kind of the nature of your life uh, and hopefully it'll kind of regrow and come back as and when you need it? Totally. Okay, I've got two more quick. One is regenerative pecan farming, which we're doing here in New Mexico, although it's not by any means the, the norm yet. But, you know, the people who are doing it are growing cover crops and livestock under pecan trees. And so it's like this total win-win on a lot of levels. And then I also wanted to mention the filmmaking of a filmmaker named Peter Bick. And he's got this new series. He's been committed to regenerative agriculture for a long time. But he's got this new series called Roots So Deep, You Can See the Devil Down There. And if you want to find out, you can go to rootssodeep.org. And at the um, Regenerate conference, we saw two out of the four episodes of this four-episode program. And it's really cool what they're doing with filmmaking and regeneration. Awesome. Yeah, I, I didn't get to see that session uh, and I'm, I'm bummed about it, but I definitely it's on my list of things to watch hopefully now in the winter when things get a little quiet and uh, a little bit more hibernation time. Yeah, I am looking forward to that, though. Yeah, we'll see if it I don't know if it's going to be on. I'm sure it'll be on like streaming services eventually. I'm not sure it is yet. So but, you know, keep an eye on it. Good point. Good point. Can you remember a time a guest said something pretty unexpected? So going back to Reginaldo Haslett Marroquin, the idea that there was like a sustainable chicken factory, even though it's not a real factory exactly, but that there was large scale or medium scale sustainable poultry farming, that was unexpected. One one Native, I don't think she said this on the air, but one Native American speaker told me, I think before we started recording, she told me that people regularly asked her if she lived in a teepee. And I was like, oh my God. I said, yeah. I said, how do you respond to that? She goes, I don't know. I was like, you should tell them that, you know, you should ask them if they arrived in a covered wagon. But anyway, um, and another thing that surprised me was I had a guest on when I was, I was traveling through New England and um, I interviewed Steve Wood, who's a an apple orchardist in western New Hampshire. And he explained to me something that I really hadn't understood, which is that there's a trade-off between organic pest management and what he does, which is called integrated pest management. And when you do integrated pest management, a lot of the time you're actually using fewer chemicals Those chemicals are not necessarily certified organic, but if you do it like right at the right moment at the beginning of the season, you actually have far fewer passes on your tractor. You have less chemistry going on to the apples than if you're doing organic. And so I'd always said, well, okay, you know, organic is the standard and let's, but it isn't necessarily in a case like that. And he was, he was saying, you know, it's really, really hard to grow apples in New England because there's just so many pests there. In California, you've got a different thing because you're using groundwater to irrigate and there isn't that proliferation of natural pests because the land they weren't there on the landscape because it was so dry. I mean, there's so much more that goes into pest management and the fact that organic isn't necessarily the one and only way to think about it. That was really surprising to me. I totally agree. I mean, I think that there is also something to be said about how much weight do we place on organic stamp and and what does that actually mean, right? Like there can be giant organizations that are certified organic, but if they aren't doing right by the soil, do we want to be supporting them 
just because they're organic. Um, we here at the farm, we are not certified organic. It is a process. It is a very, very long and rigorous process that we can't undertake. But we also are doing all of the things that most likely would qualify us as organic. We are weeding by hand. We are not doing pesticides and other chemicals. We have these practices that we believe in that not only are good for the crops, but they are also good for the soil. And so I think that your point of, are we thinking about it in a holistic way, not just following the organic light? I think that that makes us better consumers when we consider all of the opportunities that somebody may have if they're not kind of fully under this the organic certification. And of course, it makes it harder for consumers too, because how do they know which organic head of spinach was grown in a soil-friendly way and and not? So it's uh it's a process. Yeah, and that, you know, that's where the consumer advocacy, consumer knowledge, like really doing your research, really finding your local people who can help you in that search. It is hard work to be a consumer who feels really good about all of the decisions that they're making. I personally think that food is one of those ones that you should be invested in because you are literally putting it into your body. So figuring out, yes, which organic ones are better or which ones maybe are not certified organic and that's okay because you know where the food is coming from. Yeah, it it takes time. I think it's worth it. You know, I had um, Beth Hoffman on the air earlier this year and she's a she was an agriculture journalist turned farmer, Iowa farmer. And we were talking about that. And she said, you know, if you try to learn and understand it all, you know, every single piece of food you put in your mouth, you'll drive yourself crazy. And her advice was pick one thing and get really, you know, get your knowledge on that, whether it's like buying meat from your local producer or or whatever it is. And I thought that that was good. Give yourself a break, you know. I think that's great advice. Yep, totally. Great advice. Yeah, I agree. Um, Let's see. Next question. We're going to switch to kind of some book questions, which I really like. Uh, There are a lot of books about the crises we face, and many of them provide pretty weak, quote unquote, solutions, typically in the last part or chapter. But what are your favorite three books that, for 75% at least, focus more on the real solutions people can actually act out. So I've already talked about Eric Olson's book, The Regenerative Landscaper. That from beginning to end is a handbook that anybody can use. Will Harris has a new book, and we're hoping to talk to him in the new in the new year. I've already read it. It's called A Bold Return to Giving a Damn. And it's it's actually a great book to listen to on audiobook because he narrates it and he's got that beautiful southern accent. But he really talks about his own journey and how he did every step of it. So that's a real positive thing. Liz Carlisle wrote a book called Healing Grounds, Climate, Justice, and the Deep Roots of Regenerative Farming. And that is all about how BIPOC, BIPOC stands for Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, and basically all the different ways that those folks are doing and have historically done farming on this continent that has always been regenerative. And that's just, it's such an interesting book. And she's a beautiful writer. Cows Save the Planet by Judith Schwartz, and basically anything written by Judith Schwartz. She's a great author journalist. And there's another book that we didn't I talked about it on my radio shows um, back in the day, but it's a very interesting book about population and the carrying capacity of the earth and how we've very likely succeeded the carrying capacity of the earth. And if we want to get population down, here's how different countries have done it. And countries as diverse as like Thailand and Iran have done that have have limited their population to what's called replacement, which is for each couple, two children, 
approximately. And, you know, it's all about policy. So I thought that was interesting. And then I just also wanted to say anything by Gary Paul Nabhan, who is a regenerative farmer, and he's a professor at Northern Arizona University. And he is just a beautiful soul, great writer, and very much about regenerative ag and community. What was the name of the book about population? Countdown, Our Last Best Hope for a Future on Earth. Fantastic. Kind of along those same lines, the question comes in is, as a graduate of St. John's College, what, if any, are some of the classic texts that you think are most useful in this modern age? That's that's a pretty broad net, so I'm, I'm intrigued as to what your answer is going to be here. I know. It's, I, I got that question. I was like, oh, my God. And that came from our one, another wonderful farm person, grower named Nader Downey, who also went to St. John's. And he's brilliant and doing great work at Santa Fe Community College, where they've got a whole indoor agriculture program that's fantastic. But And we did a show on that. But anyway, um, so I thought about that. And I went to my shelf because all, all St. John's grad, or most of, them, most of us, like keep our shelf, you know, that has Plato and Aristotle and all that stuff on. I was like, oh, no, what am I going to do? But then I realized that there is a just super classic thing that is totally relevant, and that is the cave allegory in Plato's Republic. And that, so Plato's Republic is all this whole book, and like Plato, you know, ancient ancient Greek philosophy, it's not like straight ahead writing like Aristotle, it's always in dialogue. And the person who's speaking in the dialogues, like the wise man is Socrates. And so this Plato's Republic is all about like, what is the most just society? And like halfway through, there's this allegory of the cave. And it's all about really, it's it's all about the importance of education, and it doesn't necessarily even mean formal education, but education and not being fooled by people trying to manipulate you. So the passage basically says this. It says, imagine that there are all these people living in a cave deep underground. They've lived there all their lives. They're in chains. They can't move. They're facing a wall. Behind them, there's a fire that they can't see. And then there are people moving these little carved objects around like puppets that make shadows on the wall. And the people who are chained, they can only see the shadows. And so they think that that is reality. They think that's the only reality. And if you're one of those people and somehow you get unchained and you can turn around and you can see the fire and you can see the little puppets, at first... That's so overwhelming and confusing that like it hurts your eyes and you want to go back to your comfort zone and just look at the shadows on the wall. But then if you have a chance to actually climb out of the cave altogether and stand in the sun, well, that's even more overwhelming because you'd be blinded by the light of the sun, which is so much brighter than the light of the fire in the cave. But then after a while, you'd get used to that and you'd start seeing things as they are and seeing the cycles of nature and, you know, putting together conclusions based on reality rather than the shadows of these puppets that people in the cave were using to keep you chained up and buying the false narrative that their little puppet show was telling you. And so, like, what do you do with that? Well, I think the idea that they're getting across in this is that it's your job not only to live outside in the light, you know, in the light of truth, but then to go back down in the cave and start getting other people outdoors. And, but then when you go back down, the people who are looking at the shadows just laugh at you and don't believe you. And so it's all about kind of meeting people where they are and with wisdom to see, you know, to see where they are and to help them to see where you are and really take time to understand each other. Well, that was written over 2,000 years ago, and I think it's, I mean, in this day of internet, I mean, talk about shadows on the wall of the cave, it couldn't be more relevant. Yeah, and I think there is also something to be said there about kindness when you are trying to help bring people out from the cave. You're probably not going to get them up and out by being mean and, and by 
laughing at the fact that they thought that their reality was was staring at the walls um, with with puppets behind them. But how do we be kind to each other as we learn new things, as we try new things, as we engage with each other? I think that's that's a, a really great text. I'm I'm glad that I'm glad that you read it um, and that you uh, were able to to kind of bring that to this conversation. I am not a classic text person. Um, and so was, was excited that you had that background in you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, that was fun to revisit, actually. And I realized that I had my book on the shelf. And the translation was so hard to read. So then I found a uh, contemporary translation online. And I realized that the translation I'd been trying to read the whole time I was at St. John's was from like 1910. So it's really good to read updated translations of whatever whatever that stuff is, if it's not in English. I bet, yeah. Um, Let's see. Next question we've got here. What's an indulgence that you find difficult to go without? I thought that was such an interesting question. I want to ask you the same one, but I mean, I so, so first of all, I was like, okay, what do you mean by indulgence? Like gratification of excessive and unnecessary desires? So... And, you know, what is, like, we keep reframing what is necessary and unnecessary, like, okay, local food, you know, fruit in the winter, I make my little smoothies with frozen fruit, you know, I drink black tea every single day of my life, that's not grown locally, it's never gonna be, I eat all kinds of spices, you know, citrus fruits, like, are those indulgences? I guess so, I don't know, but I, I'd have a... You know, I could go without them, but it, it, life would be less happy. And then, you know, what about the internet? Is that an indulgence? I don't feel like I could go without that right now to do this program. I mean, you're in Denver and I'm in Santa Fe and we're talking <laughs> to each other through the internet. Cars, you know, central heating. I mean, I guess I could try to make the fireplace work, for the, but it wouldn't heat the whole house, you know. Airplane travel, I go back east every year I mean what do you what, did you come up with any yeah yeah I mean I think that um it I think an indulgence is just such a personal thing that we may not all agree on what an indulgence would be um for me an indulgence is something that just like really fills my soul and makes me really happy and I think it's also about giving yourself an indulgence, right? So like it's it often to me is like very personal. So my indulgence that I would find very difficult to go without is me giving to myself 10, 15, 20 minutes a day to read a book in silence and to just say to the world, hey world, right now is when I'm going to sit down and read and I'm going to try to do this without any incoming anything. So no text, no emails, no nothing. And just be able to sit here with some time to enjoy something that I really want to put time and effort into. Now, that may not seem super indulgent from the outset, right? It is not citrus in the winter. That is a a different, I think, a different reality. But yeah, it, it just is something that for me an indulgence i i want to like provide the definition for for myself does that make sense yeah yeah and i i mean i would even cla- personally i wouldn't even classify that as an indulgence i would say that's just like a a beautiful thing that you do like meditation or or getting enough sleep or whatever i mean that's just a a healthy and important thing for for your mind and soul i totally agree I think that in our kind of overworked and often being pulled in a million different ways life that we currently live, just setting that time aside is what feels like an indulgence. Um, Maybe not necessarily what I'm doing, but the fact that I'm saying like, hey, here's 20 minutes just for you. It is healthy. It also at times can feel indulgent because it's like, well, what else could I be doing with this 20 minutes? I could be maximizing and optimizing all of the things and instead I'm saying no I'm gonna sit here 
Yeah, but we've already we've already uh, determined that that's no good. <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Down to optimization. Um, yeah, yeah. I think it's it is such a a personal thought. Do you have anything else you want to add to that? No, but it. I think it's I think it's something for everybody to contemplate. You know, maybe our listeners will think about that too. I feel like I'm too much of a consumer, but I know people who are a lot more consumery than I am. I don't know. Yeah. It's it's worth thinking about. Yeah, I think it I I agree. I definitely agree. It's a good uh a good one to think about in the new year and and also to consider like hey, those indulgences aren't necessarily bad. I think indulgence often has kind of a negative connotation and they can get that way, but I don't necessarily think they're inherently bad. I think we've got one more here. You always seem so well prepared. How do you go about preparing for your shows? I love this question. Um, so let's see. If it's a book, which it usually isn't, but I, I do, you know, a handful of books every year. Um, I read it uh, and leave time to think about it. You know, read it carefully. Sometimes read it twice. Leave time to think about it and let questions form organically. And then whoever it is, I try to have a conversation with them before the interview, which is, a, you know, just about getting to know them and, and their work and or reading whatever I can find about them. And also, you know, if if I talk about them, talk with them beforehand, maybe they get to know me a little bit. And if they're not used to doing interviews, then they'll they'll be more comfortable having a conversation if we've already had that pre-conversation. Is there something that you have found is helpful for your guests while you're in conversation with them to either put them at ease or to help them kind of be more engaged in the conversation versus maybe just, and this usually doesn't happen with you, but like yes or no answers or, you know, kind of pulling them out a little bit to get them to really open up and tell their stories? I mean, that's, I've been doing this work for 20 years and it's a learning process that is hard to put into words, but one of the things that I do is I never have anybody on the show whom I don't respect. And then I show them respect from the beginning. So it's never an adversarial thing. Some people interview like that, probably not regenerative ag shows, but I mean, you see this in, in the news and in the media. Um, and it's, and you have to do that if you're interviewing politicians during election season or whatever. But um, I think knowing that they're respected and knowing that I already know something about them and about the subject are very big things that put people at ease. And then asking them questions that I know they're interested in. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it is always just about having a conversation and hopefully it feels like having a conversation between two friends. I know that I feel that way when I listen to this show and hopefully other people do as well. That kind of gives off a really good vibe um, and makes it, like you're saying, feel less confrontational or less forced, which some podcasts certainly can feel like. This is a off-the-cuff question from me. Um, what are some podcasts that you listen to and enjoy? I mean, I've been listening to This American Life forever. I think everybody has. Um, there's a more recent podcast called Empire, which is very good. I listen to The Moth Radio Hour, which is a storytelling podcast. I really, I really enjoy that one a lot. There's a lot of regenerative agriculture podcasts that are that are very good and very interesting. I was listening to Offline with John Favreau for a while. He is one of the people in the Crooked Media Collective and is one of the hosts of Pod Save America, which I listen to from time to time. I listen to the Ezra Klein show from time to time. Yeah, that's a sampling of them. How about you? Yeah, I am definitely more on the kind of storytelling podcast side, uh, less less interview style podcasts, which I think to your credit is why I really enjoy this podcast. 
is that you do a really great job of interviewing and of kind of crafting those stories within the interview uh, versus kind of building the story outside of the um, the actual interview in post-production and then, you know, putting it all together a la Radio Lab. Thank you. So I, I do, I, yeah, I, I listen to um, a lot of Radio Lab. Um, there's a new one called Mustang. Um, it's by a woman who did a podcast called Women's Work, which was also about uh, women in ag, especially in the Western United States. And her new podcast is about Mustangs and about their role on the land and the fact that there are so, so, so many more Mustangs out there in the wild than the landscape can sustain. Um, so that's that's a really great one. I have to listen to that. Yeah, definitely, definitely get in on that one. Um, another one that I am really enjoying is called The Unmarked Graveyard. It is by Radio Diaries, and it basically tells the story of Heart Island, which is America's largest public cemetery. It's outside of New York, there are no headstones, basically just numbered markers. And historically, people who, you know, were were buried there were, you know, anonymous. They maybe didn't have family or we couldn't find their family when they were being buried. And only recently have the graves been kind of open now to the public. And so people can go and, you know, if they, if they know that their family member was buried there, now they can go and see where they were buried. And it just, yeah, has a really great storytelling feel and and just like looking at the world in a totally different lens. So that yeah, that's that's really, you know, when I listen to podcasts, which I listen to a lot of them because I do a lot of weeding out in the field and podcasts keep me company. When I'm doing that, I'm looking for kind of just a different lens to the life. And again, I think that you do a great job of bringing those people on who are doing that, who are looking at life in a different lens and offering their their learnings and their thoughts and their experimentations and their failings sometimes uh, to the rest of us. And I think that just makes us kind of a more diverse audience to be able to hear hear them and hopefully recognize the work that they're putting in and and take away something that we can potentially use in our own lives. So yeah, a, a big thank you to to your continued work on this podcast because I think it is um it's a it's a great a great platform for the regenerative ag movement as well as just for people who are learners uh, and and hopefully we we all are. Well, and I have some listeners like friends back east and others who who aren't farmers at all and the fact that they're listening to it makes me happy because it it means that because one of the things I I think is really important to do, at least for this podcast, not for all the Regen Ag podcasts, is to reach people who both who are and aren't working on the land, and make it accessible to all groups of people, because so much of it is just about consumer education, and so much of it is about I mean this is this is sort of the tagline you know Down to Earth is a podcast about hope, we are about solutions, we're about people who are already doing the work and doing it well not just the the impediments to the work although it's important to talk about that too. I agree and and again if you know if we all become a little bit more educated about where our food is coming from or how ag is doing things to the soil positive or you know negative uh I think that again that makes us an educated consumer an educated audience um and there there's no downside to that. We got a question oh, yeah. that, that I love, and I'm going to read it. It says, Most of your podcasts are good news stories about what people are doing to build a more resilient world. Assuming that some in our government would be interested in this, what would it take to package a powerful selection of stories and present them to national decision makers and opinion leaders in order to influence the national decision process toward supporting the continued exploration and development of the work we all do? That's a long way of saying, hey, how can you make the lawmakers and decision makers listen to this message? The answer is, I don't know. 
It's, but I'm put, I wanted to put the question out there because if there's people who are listening who want to work on this or who want to help us to think about it, I'm really open to that. Yeah, I agree. Um, we got this one and, and MC and I were trying to like decide, like, how do we do this? Is there an answer? Is there not an answer? Um, and, and I really love the question because I, I think the, telling of stories. And I I think that you probably feel similarly. Um, The telling of stories is usually what can make things change. People tell stories to share their lives and to help people understand more of what they're going through. And so I love the idea of packaging a selection of stories and and trying to present it. Obviously, the the nitty gritty of how you do that and where it goes and and what's included is kind of the the deeper work. But yeah, I, I think your call for, hey, who's out there and who can help us do this is an exciting one you know hopefully somebody hears it and and can can jump in and and help us to to think through that question a little bit more and um maybe maybe you and i will brainstorm about it and maybe some others i mean you know filmmaker peter bick there's also there's all kinds of great media makers in this world and maybe we can sort of come together and find a way to really get this in the ear of lawmakers, because I think regenerative ag is one of those very few issues that transcend politics. It's not right, left, or center. It's about food health and health of the earth, health of farmers, health of communities, land and water. I totally agree. Uh, Before we kind of wrap up here, what are you excited or looking forward to in 2024? Uh, Are there any any previews that you want to offer or anything that listeners should be on the lookout for? Well, I'm hoping that I did get Will Harris's book. So I'm hoping to have Will on sometime in the spring. And we've got a list of wonderful people who we don't have scheduled yet. So I don't want to say any names yet, but who we're hoping to have on the show. But one thing that I do want to do if if people are still listening, because we've been talking for a long time, is I really would love to hear more from listeners. When I was at the Regenerate conference, I got some wonderful feedback and people saying, oh, I listen, but they don't tend to email. And so if you would like to send a message, a comment, an idea for people who we could have on the air, I mean, on the show, or just anything else, just like, hey, this is what I'm doing. I really, it makes such a difference to me personally as a host to hear from listeners. So mc at radiocafe.org is my email. You can also go to the site downtoearthradio.com and find it. So yeah, that'd be, that's something I just wanted to put out there. I think another really important aspect of of 2024 and and podcasting in the world that we are currently in is asking for support from the listeners. And so some of you may or may not know that we do have a Patreon for Down to Earth and would love for your support there financially to continue to be able to do this work and to continue to share the stories that MC brings so well into your ears every other week. It is not an easy or inexpensive process um, and we want to make sure that we can continue to do that work. It really does make a difference and um, we're excited to, to roll out some new benefits for Patreon subscribers and uh, more exciting changes in 2024. And we will put the link to that in the show notes. It's Patreon is one of those sites where you can donate like as low as three bucks a month. And it's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. And it's patreon.com slash down to earth planet to plate, I think is the is the URL. Yeah, we'll get that in the show notes. I think also good to get the all the the books that you recommended. Definitely want people to be able to to check those out. And you can basically find everything, like links to everything that we've talked about in the show notes. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to to bring up at this point? No, but I just wanted to say I'm really glad that you're with the organization and doing great work and I hear wonderful things about you and I'm really excited to keep working together. 
I am really looking forward to 2024 and um, continuing the great work of Down to Earth. And we appreciate everybody for putting in their questions. Um, As MC said, if you have further questions or ideas, uh, please email her and we'll we'll hopefully be able to do something like this again. Um, I know it's it's a it's fun. It's a fun conversation for me to have um, and hopefully fun for people to listen to as well. Yeah, this is super fun. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Down to Earth. We would love it if you would support this program, which you can do by going to patreon.com slash down to earth planet to plate, where you can sign up for as little as $3. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And also please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The Kivira Coalition is a not-for-profit and a community network of ranchers, farmers, conservationists, scientists, educators, and many others dedicated to regenerative practices that produce healthy food, support meaningful livelihoods, sustain biodiversity, and remedy the impacts of climate change. To learn more about Kivira and how you can support their work, visit kiviracoalition.org, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. And finally, this show is a production with the Radio Cafe. You can check out radiocafe.org to hear back episodes of this show and also find all kinds of other shows on a wide variety of topics as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.